This is Dr. Dave Septel from Macula News reporting from Arvo 2014. We're here with Professor Stephen Tang from Columbia University. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, David. First of all, tell us a little bit about your department and what your key focus is. So I'm at the Harkness Eye Institute here at uh, Columbia and also you are associated with the New York Presbyterian Hospital. We are the, uh, the referral center for different in inherited eye diseases in the tri-state area and, and, and uh, beyond. We have uh, pa taken care of patients from all over the world, from Africa, from Asia, from Europe as well. So most of our patients have been seen by some other retina specialist and then we do further uh, investigation and try to predict also what's the molecular basis of the disease and also what's the uh, future, the prognosis for these patients. Now what is your specific focus? So I've been uh, work since uh, 1992. Uh, I'm working on uh, initially using uh, embryonic stem cells to generate mouse model for patient-specific uh, diseases. And mo more recently, we're using both the mouse model using embryonic stem cells and also in uh, to treat mouse model with uh, different forms of uh, degenerative diseases in the retina. And in the last few years, since the discovery of the skin-derived induced pluripotent stem cell, we also have used it both to treat mouse models, using human cells to treat mouse models, and at the same time also to use them to, yeah, this, this, this session earlier, there are diseases that uh, mouse may not be an appropriate model, so then we can use the uh, patient-specific stem cells to model and uh, try to figure out the mechanisms, pathophysiology, and then develop some treatment in patient-specific cells. The difference between mouse models is mouse is still a model, mm -hmm. but now if we have uh, patients, it's not a really, it's the patient cell, so it's not a model, it's actually almost you can think of the disease in a dish type of scenario. If we look back at last year this time, what are the most significant changes that you've seen since uh, that time? The most significant change that the, the, is the one that uh, Professor Bennett at the uh, University of Pennsylvania reported that the U.S. government regulatory agency, the Federal Drug Administration, would accept the using patient-specific cell lines as a uh, surrogate for, uh, for animal models in case of uh, uh, diseases that the animal model may not completely mimic the disease. So she, demonstrated, she presented her data to the FDA and FDA would uh, allow the go ahead to start uh, human studies without, in the, in, in the past we have to go through a mouse model that mimic the human disease, but now we can use patient cells directly to validate either your drugs or in this case uh, gene therapy treatment vectors and then go directly to, uh, to patients as a, as a phase one clinical trial. So how is that changing your particular research? Are you moving into that realm as well? Yeah, so the, the slightly more sophisticated uh, uh, addition that, that is to now, uh, also in the, not just the last year, the last few months, as uh, Professor uh, Bud Tucker uh, described, new technology that came from Berkeley, uh, that now you can uh, design footprint-free gene correction. That means that you can do genetic surgery to correct spinal mistakes in patients' uh, DNA without uh, any uh, trace that you have done the surgery. And th th so this is a, another step closer for autologous uh, transplantation. So you, autologous transplantation that imagine one day a patient walk in, you will take a little bit of uh, skin sample or conjunctival uh, sample and then you make them patient-specific cell line. You do a gene repair of that patient, and then you can differentiate them into retina cells and give it back to the same patient. I think this will be almost, you can say, the holy grail uh, of, uh, of uh, the future of uh, medicine. Such proof of principle has been done in hematology for sickle cell anemia. So we anticipate that similar approach will be also can be applied to ophthalmology.
So it's an extraordinary time to be involved in this particular line of research. Yeah. A few years ago, I wouldn't have even dreamed that this, even it sounds like science fiction. Right. And the rapid of pace of improvement in technology, so only in 2000, and embryonic stem cell was first isolated by Elizabeth J. Robertson and Martin Evans uh, at Cambridge and independently by Gail Martin in uh, San Francisco in, in uh, around in the uh, uh, late 80s. And, and then and, uh, now there's some uh, human trials with, um, uh, with embryonic stem cell, um, but that's, that still takes almost uh, two decades. And the skin-derived stem cell was uh, isolated, I mean, uh, 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 engineered, uh, uh, by Professor Yamanaka in Kyoto and in 2006. And probably within uh, sometime next year, this will be also applied in, uh, for macular degeneration uh, in, in Japan. So, so the source of your cells is skin cells, epithelial cells, not adipose cells. Is there something specific about skin cells that uh, make them attractive? So it's very accessible to, I mean, it, it, you can do it in, just in the office setting. Uh, more recently, in the last year, we found that you can also do uh, tick cells on the conjunctiva also. So it depends right. if uh, whatever the patient uh, prefer is pretty much identical. And the skin-derived stem cell is, uh, by most purposes, is really uh, almost the same as uh, embryonic stem cell taken from pre-implantation embryo. Mm -hmm. And it has the advantage of say you want to have patient disease in a dish, you can you can um, uh, create them readily from the patient instead of using embryonic stem cells. Then you need to find the correct right. genotype, and you, there's quite a lot of uh, 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 looking at the DNA to find the right uh, disease. But now uh, patient come to us, they have have the disease, and it's kind of the. It, uh, you can uh, a step, a closer step was personalized medicine. That would be the ultimate of personalized medicine. It's taking patients' cells, and then you can do a uh, gene repair and put it back to the patient. And and only in the last few months, not just the last year, the gene repair technology was was really uh, just came out this uh, a, a few months ago. That in terms of harvesting the skin cells, is there a particular area of the skin, or does any skin Surface. Any any skin will do. The I mean, most classic people take it from the forearm. In in my lab, I take it at, at the back mm -hmm. because it's uh, hidden by a belt. And <coughs> so, if it, uh, swimming swimming trunks, so people can go swimming and nobody will notice. He, sometimes you can uh, we we put a uh, suture so it doesn't create a dimple. So we, we, in in if we have little kids in the same day. If the youngest we are four year old and then they go back to the usual routine. I mean, just, just, just in a, within an hour when we take the skin biopsy. So how long does it take to prepare? Once you collect a sample to the preparation uh, and return to the patient, what is that uh, usual time course currently? Uh, you cannot do that return to the patient yet because of uh, FDA regulations. Right, but once, <laughs> that, once that will become uh, uh, in place. So the, the uh, to mix uh, stem cells from uh, from the skin, it takes about uh, two weeks now. Uh, and also, some last year it would take us about a month, but that this year is about two weeks now. And then from the stem cell to become uh, retinal cells, that typically take about three months. And then in between, if you want to do a gene repair, they will add a, 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 another extra uh, two months or so for the gene repair. And what is the ideal combination of gene therapy and stem cell therapy in terms of timing and in terms of uh, patient selection? So gene therapy requires the cells to alive to receive the gene. Right. So many of our patients, when they come to us, uh, this, they, they don't have cells already. So then in order for them to, say, re regain function. Mm -hmm. So you can think of gene therapy, uh, at least the current goal is uh, to stabilize what the current vision uh, the patient has. And then the future for regenerative medicine is that people can gain back what the vision, vision they lost already. 
And then you can think of that the uh, personalized medicine is then you can now uh, uh, correct each patient's spelling mistake in their DNA, in their, in, in their cells, and put it back and to the patients when the cells are, have disappeared. So, so I mean, gene benefit make a scenario. I mean, the, 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 that uh, what current gene therapy uh, 10 years ago is pretty much what uh, the current state of uh, stem cells. Uh, so you probably, although there are some trials uh, starting in, in Japan and then there's an embryonic stem cell trial in, in, uh, in California, the, uh, the timeline to be a little more uh, widely uh, available, you can imagine will be similar to what gene therapy was 10 years ago. So if you were telling patients <clears throat> about the future, you were telling patients now gene therapy is much closer to the clinic than stem cell therapy. Right, at, at, the, at, the, uh, at the current time. Right. What do you think needs to happen in terms of uh, stem cells in, in terms to, to, to speed up that process? So the, uh, a lot of, uh, as, as we learned in the session earlier, a lot, uh, yeah. is, is the, the cost of regulatory. Uh, of course, the, 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 the first, row, the first uh, uh, golden rule for the Hippocratic Oath is to do no harm, mm -hmm. but they, there's also increasing amount of paperwork. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, as even for the human gene therapy trial, they need to contract a, a company to, go to help to do the uh, paperwork. And as discussed, we wasn't a, uh, uh, a, a solution that, that the panel has, uh, has come up with for in terms of the regulation for autologous transplantation. Mm -hmm. So the, you mean, the, you mean the, the cells on the, the skin cells on the patient to, to become bad retina cells in the same patient. Right. We do not uh, know what the regulatory uh, route, if, if, it, if the government would regulate it like bone marrow transplantation, autologous bone marrow transplantation, then you would expect it to be much more wider uh, available, but then if the uh, government want every patient to go through FDA with their own cell line, then you can imagine that that, that may not be so uh, practical to many different patients. And, maybe, and, and the cost, you can imagine the cost uh, will be done. So as a business model going forward, uh, how do you see the provision of, of these therapies? People would, uh, do doctors would take a skin specimen yeah. and send it to centers of excellence such as yours. You would then create the, the, the appropriate uh, preparation for return to the patient. Uh, do, you, do you see them many centers of excellence or do you still see this being concentrated in uh, institutions such as your own? So uh, the, it will depend how the government regulates it. So, so if, if uh, FDA regulates the, uh, uh, the procedure, so you look at one has a reproducible uh, good manufacturing procedure, and then you, not, you do not require uh, mm -hmm. each cell line, then I can imagine that there will be centralized uh, good manufacturing practice facility will handle it for uh, probably not if, uh, even individual institutions, they would be localized in geographic areas in the, in the, in the country. And this centralized uh, good manufacturing practice, it could be commercial companies can, can, uh, can also take that role. And so this how, so if, if the government just regulate the procedure rather than individual patients, uh, specific uh, cell lines, then once, once the procedure proven to be safe, and, and then, uh, then you can imagine that each uh, uh, doctor, some different uh, offices, would just send the cells to a central good manufacturing practice laboratory. And, and then th this can be uh, probably the later for the monitoring will still go to certain centers that have been have a little bit more experience, at least in the, in the initial stage. So the, uh, but eventually it will be more widely available. Uh, tell us about what you have in the pipeline, what research you're working on, and what you expect uh, that to deliver. So, mo so we, we did some proof of principle studies. I mean, we also show that you can use the uh, patient-specific uh, stem cell lines, as in the earlier session, as a recipient for, for gene therapy. 
And then we show efficacy, the, the both efficacious in the patient-specific stem cell lines, and then we validate in a mouse model so that the, the uh, gene therapy uh, vectors are efficacious in both scenarios. We have used the uh, patient, I, I, and then in, even though the mouse model in this case is some uh, uh, disparity between the human uh, disease that we observe, we also use the uh, uh, patient-specific stem cell line to address uh, mechanisms mm -hmm. of the disease in, in en route to maybe instead of gene therapy, uh, it, it can be, if you can understand the disease mechanism, you can design a drug also for pharmacological uh, therapy. Uh, what wasn't discussed, but we have a uh, manuscript that came, is, uh, came out in on, um, PubMed in Human Molecular Genetics uh, we apply to more common disease than, than inherited forms of retinal degeneration. We apply it to age-related macular degeneration and try to figure out some of the, uh, a lot of the genetic risk factors have been found in macular degeneration, but the function of the uh, genetic risk factor, the genes involved, the function of genes is unknown. So. We have generated patient-specific stem cell lines and make them into uh, retina cells, and then we compare uh, people with uh, uh, homozygous high risk and patients with homozygous low risk allele, and then we found that the, maybe the reason that, that the patients with the uh, low genetic risk allele uh, do not get macular degeneration because we found that they have a very high endogenous uh, activity to cope with uh, oxidative stress versus patients with uh, genetic risk factors. or In fact, those patients have macular degeneration, and they also ha have the genetic risk factors, and they have uh, low capacity to respond to uh, oxidative uh, stress. So in other words, their intrinsic <laughs> antioxidant capacity is greater. In, in people who do not, do not have do macular degeneration. Now, there have been uh, discussion about the use of adjuvant factors in this, and whether carotenoids, for example, are, are useful to be used in combination with these therapies. Because once you implant uh, stem cells in a patient, uh, their viability is obviously going to be determined by a yeah. number of factors. If they've still got an underlying yeah. genetic problem, those cells may deteriorate and die, and you would have to be back to the beginning. What are you looking at in terms of, of that particular issue? So, so the the uh, one approach is, uh, is the one that was uh, um, also been discussed by Professor Bud Tucker mm -hmm. in Iowa, that the, the, the gene repair technology has, it in, uh, has become uh, much easier. Just in the last few months, even not become last year. Two, two, year, two years ago, it, uh, to do a gene repair would probably cost uh, at least $40,000 using the sink finger nucleates. With the more recently described technology, we, uh, at least in the laboratory setting, we could we would take like a few hundred, I mean, maybe like two hundred dollars is enough to uh, have the uh, reagent for for uh, for gene repair, and and, they, and this and the de because just the design is much easier than 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 previously. So one 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 scenario you can correct the do a gene repair. The other thing there for, especially for the uh, congenital inherited forms of uh, conditions like Stargardt form of macular degeneration. But then for uh, the age-related macular degeneration, you can envision that maybe you do not need to do the gene repair because uh, when skin-derived stem cells make into retina cells, they, uh, we and others have shown that they, have, uh, they are almost fetal in origin. If the disease takes 65 years to, to, to cause problems, so now you're, re, you, you're kind of resetting the clock every time you're reprogramming mm -hmm. the, uh, the, ret, uh, the dis, uh, retinal cells to reprogram the disease, and it takes another 60 years for them to die again <laughs> once you do the reprogramming. Right. And the use of, of carotenoids, does that have value in the post-transplant era? Yeah, so, so you, so again, you, you, you can, uh, pre uh, prevention is always better than an ounce of cure, right? right? So you can prevent the disease from happening, and uh, so, so you can think of the, 
preventative medicine. Uh, well, uh, again, the, the stem cell will be helpful to think of what a agents could be prevent the uh, the uh, onset of disease. In, that, in addition to the current uh, mm -hmm. uh, epidemiological or, or current uh, uh, ongoing uh, studies, then you can think of the um, you can uh, intervene or stabilize the disease by gene therapy. And at a stage when the, all the cells died away, then you can uh, you can then stem cell would have a a, a role. So the different uh, treatment will be uh, stage dependent on, on the disease and that's uh, and probably uh, personalized also so there's advocacy to to think about personalized or precision medicine exactly based on what the genetic constitution of each uh, particular uh, patient is there anything else you'd like to add well we are li we're living in a uh, extraordinary times in terms of uh, we're now in repairing genes in, in a patient and in uh, uh, considering autologous stem cell transplantation. I mean, those, those things that we are in the forefront of medicine that we cannot even dream of. Even a few years ago, I could not have dreamed of that you can do gene repair with uh, $200 uh, even a, 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 a year ago. But they, but we we have the uh, technology is all all, all there. But, but um, I guess unfortunately the U.S. economy is not doing as well as. Uh, so this is actually last year is also the worst in terms of uh, mm -hmm. uh, support from the the National Institute of uh, Health funding. So uh, both as physicians as a patient, we should uh, try to do our part to. As, as physician, you should we should help to educate the public that uh, uh, research is important. If not, we will not have all this new technology, and the public also need to indicate that the, the, uh, the this is uh, for the, for the uh, important for to once the cure of disease. The public need to to uh, educate also when to to the uh, Congress or the Senate level that you know the for this have you know in order to one day to treat patients with their own, uh, they need to support the research program at a, at a government level. That's a very, very important point. I mean, my background's in internal medicine yeah. and sports medicine, yeah. and when I look at what's happening in, in ophthalmology, and in particularly the area that you're working in, the implications for the rest of the body are phenomenal. Uh, I think that, uh, that your work is, is uh, advancing our ability to understand and to implement the same types of therapies for other diseases as well. So yes, yeah, so for example, the current safety trial for embryonic stem cells is only for the eye uh, in America at, at, at this point. So the eye has a particular advantage. It's a pretty much a transparent organ. We can see almost uh, in the individual cells that when the cells put in, and then the, and then. Uh, there's always a control immediately on your on your fellow eye. So any kind of treatment, there's already a built-in uh, auto, uh, automatic control. And ophthalmologists are probably the only uh, specialist, specialist, say, would watch a tumor grow. GI doctor would take out the smallest polyp. Dermatologist would take out the smallest pigmented uh, lesion. But because of the precision in all the imaging technology, ophthalmologists actually feel comfortable looking at tumor, a, a very lethal uh, cancer, like choroidal melanoma, watching it grow until a certain size before any intervention is done, partly because the intervention would destroy vision. And because we can monitor the, so one of the side, side effects of stem, you always, people always keep in the back of mind, what about if the, the stem cells has potential to become all kinds of cells? What about it become a, it's always a concern, although I think the, in the last, a few, uh, few years, the protocol is getting better, so I don't think we, we will get any immature cells before we say put it back to the patient. But there's always a potential that that they become a uh, tumor or cancer. But then of the precision and the eyes of the uh, ability to monitor the transplant. So even though uh, any kind of uh, undesired outcome, it can be taken care of. I mean, the worst scenario, we, we, we can treat a tumor derived from a stem cell just 
like colloidal melanoma that we are used to taking care of right. in case the, the rare event actually happened. And probably that's the reason why that, that both in Japan and this country, the target disease is in, is, is in, is in the retina for stem cell transplantation. Well, we're living at uh, the, uh, the most exciting time that I can imagine in, in, uh, in medicine and in, in, in science. But unfortunately, because of the U.S. economy, the government support is, is not quite there. So we, we need to do our part, and the patients need to also do their part to, to talk to uh, Congress and Senate that uh, this kind of research is important. Absolutely.